Welcome to this session about my uh, 50 watt Chinese laser machine. Now I've owned the machine for four months now and we've done some tutorial videos of how to get the machine up and running and there's also a series about RD Works which is the piece of software that came with the machine. Today's session is going to be a little bit different because here we are four months on and um, I've certainly had a few traumas with the machine. Um, I've made lots of mistakes I've made some changes to the machine which I hesitate to call improvements but they're things that suit me. Now what I'm planning to do in this session is just take you through some of the things that I've changed on the machine. I suppose one of the most significant changes that I've made is to remove the extraction fan that you can see down there. So you can now see that my blue extraction pipe there feeds down into a centrifugal fan. Basically, this is a fan from a bouncy castle, kids' bouncy castle. Now, it's a very, very powerful fan. It's probably something like about four or 500 watts of power, and it has got a tremendous throughput of air. These might be quite expensive to buy new, but you've only got to look around eBay, and you'll find loads of second-hand bouncy castles where even if you buy the bouncy castle for £30 or $50 and throw the castle away, you've got yourself a very cheap extraction system. The only problem is you've got to make your own flanges to fit onto the fan, both here and here, that will adapt up to this 16-inch pipe. And this is a 4-inch pipe, but this is a very strong, flexible 4-inch outlet pipe that wraps around underneath my machine trolley there and allows me to do this because if I want to use it during the winter months when it's raining I can just close my workshop door onto it like that and that'll keep most of the rain and the weather out and I don't have to be too fussy about pulling that tube right out into the yard because the velocity of air streaming out that four inch pipe is very high and the fumes get projected right across the yard before they get dissipated. And even though I've got the door open, the air is flowing through here at quite a high velocity capturing any fumes that come up. Now at one stage I anticipated using the machine with the door down and this little front panel removed because there is a slit of air along the front here, there's a gap along the front here where the air can get in. Now to get a good extraction you have to have good airflow through and I was anticipating that that would be a good enough airflow so that I could get plenty of extraction through there but it tends to produce a jet which goes right across the top and I actually find that it's better to leave the door just slightly open so that I've got this large area here for the air to flow into. So I have got a socket block which I've um, attached to the side of the machine so that I can turn my um, I can turn my fan off and this is the machine on and off as well power on and off and this item here is additional lighting. I've used some uh, self-adhesive LED strip lights here to add to the amount of light in the front of the machine because the lights that are supplied with this machine are fairly blue in nature and they're not all that bright. Now having owned large metal cutting lasers before um, this is just a, a little toy for my retirement to keep my brain active. Um, I decided that one of the most important things that you need when you're cutting is control of your air pressure. So I've stuck a, a, an air pressure gauge on here to monitor the blowing pressure that comes down to the nozzle. Um, I did this before I knew too much about the performance of the machine. As you probably can hear, the air supply is on here at the moment. Now I'm going to put my finger on the end of the nozzle but I have actually got the laser completely switched off so there's no chance of any accident occurring but if I block off the nozzle I've probably got about one psi of pressure that that pump is able to deliver. Now the pump that I'm using is the pump that was supplied with the machine. 
Now, you might think that I've got this rather strangely hung up in the air, but trust me, if I hang it by its handle, it's virtually silent. If you mount it on its feet, it makes a fairly serious noise. Now, the pump itself is feeding into a pressure regulator. Now, these pressure regulators are very easily available on eBay, very, very, very cheaply and you don't want to buy the ones with the filters on them what I suggest you do is something like I've done here which is to get hold of a couple of paint spray filters these normally fix onto the uh, onto the end of a spray gun to stop the water going into uh, a paint sprayer but if you can put two of these stacked on top of each other you can absolutely guarantee that there will be no water getting up this line which could contaminate your lens area and your nozzle area and the only reason I've got it on a pressure regulator is because there are times when I'm cutting paper, for example, that I need to turn the air right down to very, very low pressure because the air pressure would actually blow the paper away from the nozzle. Although I've put a gauge on here, um, I put the gauge on there because I thought I was going to be using a large workshop compressor. But in reality, the actual little compressor that's supplied is perfectly adequate for doing the job and I don't really need that gauge on, a, on there. That's just something that I thought would be a good improvement that didn't turn out to be. Now hiding under there we've got a, a copper coil. That was something that I made when I thought my laser was losing power because of over temperature in the cooling water. I'm absolutely sure that that isn't the case and I'm going to be doing some work in the future to establish just what sort of temperature it requires to start losing power on the laser. Right, we'll just have a look at my cooling system here now. The cooling system is supplied with a normal, um, like a fountain pump, and on the end of the fountain pump you've got this end cap which allows variable flow to go into the motor, and a filter I believe is in there as well. Well, you're using absolutely pure water, there's no pond debris or anything you have to worry about, so first of all throw the filter away, and secondly take the end cap off because you don't want any restrictions to flow. There was this strange fitting supplied which sort of would do the job. It would go into the top of the pump there and you could connect the pipe onto that piece there. Um, but it was restricting the flow so I've made sure I've got rid of all the flow restrictions and basically this is full bore pipe all the way through to the machine now. I've got something like about nine or ten litres in this little plastic container which has got a lid on it. Now I find it's quite important to keep the lid on it because as you can see you get condensation inside here and you don't really want to lose the water. Um, this is distilled water and uh, I don't know it costs about three or four pound for five litres so it's not something you really want to waste too much. And as you can see I've got a, a thermometer on the side here which I can just keep an eye on the temperature of the water. Now one of the most important things to remember is the outflow. When it comes back from the pump, make sure that that outflow pipe is beneath your water level. That way you won't cause bubbles and pass bubbles through the laser. It's getting to a point now where once it gets to roughly to these handles, the top of the pump will start to get exposed and I think I should probably start drawing air in. So I shall have to probably soon Fill, fill this up to um, another inch or so. And the one thing I have done is change the material on the bed of this machine because this is the bed that it was supplied with and it's thin sheet aluminium. Aluminium is one of the more difficult materials to cut. The reason being, although it's a soft material, the crystalline structure of the material is extremely reflective. It's got nothing to do with the shininess of the surface, it's the crystal structure of the material itself when it's in its solid state. It just does not absorb infrared radiation. It reflects 99.5% of anything that is fired at it. Now, that's great because it won't melt, but it's bad because it's going to reflect any rays directly back at you if you happen to be in the way. So what I've done as an alternative is to cut, get a piece of steel, cut a piece of steel so that it is a perfect fit between the pillars 
and it lines up with the front and the back edge of the table there and then it's just slightly too big to go between these pillars unless I just lift it up a little bit in the middle pop it in between the pillars and let it go now it's jammed out against the pillars and it won't move steel has got a, a better absorption characteristic than the aluminium and so although there will still be some reflections off this material there won't be as much but I'm going one stage further than using this as my base now the jobs have to be supported on something unless you're etching in which case you could put something straight onto this surface and etch it but if you're going to cut through something then you need to raise it off the deck and my solution is to organize a fully flexible um, support system which is basically a piece of eight millimeter acrylic material with holes drilled through it at 25 mil pitch and a couple of magnets here which are set into the surface the magnets that I've used in these little plates are very powerful neodymium magnets now, now I've put that onto that base plate now that steel base plate but I can't pull it off even with my fingernails I can't get my fingernails underneath to pull it off the only way I'm going to be able to get that off there is to slide it off the edge so we certainly don't want these magnets to be on the underside of these plates because if they're on the underside of the plate I just won't be able to, to lift them off so by putting a small air gap underneath the magnet which I've done by having approximately a millimeter of this material in the bottom of that slot it means that I can control the amount of attraction to stick to the base plate but still be easy enough to lift off and move around. In my particular instance I've got some special pins which are just happen to be surplus to requirement. These are springy pins which are used for testing printed circuit boards usually. They're surplus to requirements and all I have to do is to drop them in at various positions to suit the job. Now they could be solid pins, they could be M3 grub screws for example which happen to be maybe 25 mil long. If you put 3 mil holes you can put grub screws in there. Just drop them in and use them as pins. You can put 3 millimeter dowels in. Uh, there's all sorts of options. The only thing is to make sure that all the items that you're buying are the same length. Well after four months of owning the machine um, I feel that I'm beginning to get somewhere now. Um, I understand a lot of the programming system, I understand a lot of the uh, idiosyncrasies of the machine, um, but I'm still far from being an expert. However, I'm thoroughly enjoying the process of learning about the machine. I would recommend anybody getting one if they've got a small business or they've got a serious hobby that they want to pursue. Um, I had neither of those intentions in mind. Mine was just straightforward pleasure. I suspect the videos will be a little bit more spaced out in future for two reasons. First of all, my wife is bitching about the to-do list, which is not getting done. And secondly, fewer and fewer new things that I can find out about the machine to tell you. So here we are at the four-month point, a very happy camper. Thanks a lot for watching. <laughs>